Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art and photography today, specifically through the career of one Saul Leiter. Today, I am again joined by one of our top contributors, my favorite nude to see, Mr. T. T is for the buck. Welcome, buck. Famous nude to see. That was a good one. <laughs> I, I'm waiting for the time when I can I can become senior contributor. Uh, Esquire. I, I think at this pace, uh, where you're gonna be, you are a senior contributor. I feel like at this pace, where where I'm I'm probably gonna bill you as a co-host here pretty soon. Oh, geesh. Yeah. Thank you. Finally, getting the recognition I deserve. My favorite co-host, my favorite top contributor, senior contributor. How about executive? I feel like if you put executive in front of anything, it sounds really, really official. Sure, it's just like in like (laughs) what? What is it? I was watching uh, Wolf of Wall Street, and they gave like everybody like a senior vice president title. (laughs) Shit, we need that. God, that I'm kind of glad you brought that up. That's a perfect Scorsese film to to review in this show because it's it's definitely not extremely famous from his filmography but um i feel like i feel like it would be more it's not really a deep cut but i feel like there'd be enough to talk about there yeah it, it's it's a little different from like the rest of his stuff uh but it's still kind of got that gangster yeah kind of there's kind of. some there's that there's that scorsese feel but of course yep. today we're talking about art and photography and this is a very special episode because this is mr buck's favorite one of his favorite artists is one of his favorite photographers. Now, mm. we are going to flip the script on you guys today. Instead of me giving the normal intro and thesis like we normally do, I'm going to pass the torch over to Mr. Buck and let him do the honors. But of course, before we go into a, a discussion, we need a little background. Is it my turn to talk? Yeah, yeah. You talk do I get now. the talk? Oh my gosh, here you we talk, go. You, you, give the, you give the intro. I'm giving it, give it to them. Okay. Give it, give it to them. Okay. Got to, I got to get the, got to feel my inner, you know, inner Novo here. <laughs> inner so. Novo. Yeah. Sell it. <laughs> now you're, All now right. You're, now, you, now you got to do it. Got to talk like this. Okay. No, <laughs> just, just joking. Do it. I, I anyway, tease me. I don't care. Go no, I, I'm, I'm giving you crap. Um, no, but, uh, Saul Leiter, uh, why does it matter? He's an influential artist. Um, he's considered to be an early pioneer of color photography. Um, pushing boundaries of what photography is, um, what it can be, and what it can be in not just today, but in the future. And this is a bold statement to say for, for a guy that did a lot of majority of his work in the middle of the 20th century. So a little intro um, in the background here. He was born December 3rd, 1923. Um, his early young life, he wanted to study to be a rabbi. He moved to New York and wanted to be an artist. That was his dream. Um, he became he first started out as a painter, actually. Um, and I know Novo, you've kind of did a deep dive into a lot of his paintings and kind of that um, his, oh, we're his talent talk about there. It. So yeah. we'll definitely talk about that. But I think that's a really important point to talk about his painting because it really kind of leads into his photography. If you haven't checked out Saul Leiter, definitely go look at his, his uh, work. Um, He was a prominent photographer and painter um, in the forties and fifties. And he really was part of this class of what was called the New York school of photography and American author and curator, art curator, uh, Jane Livingston. uh, She was the person that first coined this kind of term and what it really is, is what she says, it's a loosely defined group of photographers who lived and worked in New York during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, who just, although disinclined uh, to commit themselves to any group or belief. I think that's a really broad statement, but <laughs> um, but if, if you think about the era, especially the people that saw Leiter uh, hung around, like Diane Arbus, uh, Eugene Smith, William Klein, if you look at their whole work of art, you can really kind of tell that they, they just weren't really, they were non-traditionalists in the sense they, they really went on towards an abstract uh, kind of feel with their uh, work. So Saul was a known photographer. I wouldn't say he was well known. Um, he wasn't like a, you know, a really household name or anything, but he Why did is a your lot favorite of, then? 
it, well, it, it, we're coming up here. It, it really wasn't until the 90s uh, when he really started to get, gain traction. And it really was kind of with his color work. So he did a lot of work with um, like magazines, uh, fashion. That was kind of what he was known for before. He did uh, things like uh, L British uh, Vogue, uh, Queen and Nova. He would do, uh, uh, he did uh, work later in his life, especially uh, in Esquire and Harper's Bazaar. I think there was a real famous photo shoot that he did in Harper's Bazaar in, in the 2000s. And he, he did have some art exhibitions. His uh, first one was, um, uh, it was called Always the Young Stranger. And I believe that was a, I believe that was actually on his uh, painting work at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in 1945. Uh, but yeah, like what I was telling you, Novo, it, why I really like this guy and why he is a big impact to me was his really his color work. And I think most importantly, is his composition. I think this is a perfect time to dive in the discussion, right? Yeah. Yep. So we need to, uh, for anybody listening out there, we need to separate this guy into two camps. Yep. Uh, the first half of the discussion is really, it's clearly he is classically trained as an artist, as a, yep. as a painter specifically. And so I knew the first half of this, we had to talk about his paintings. Yep. And then obviously that's going to be leading into the main crux of who, what he became famous for, which is his photography, because there's so much of his painting style in his photography work. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to start probably with his abstract expressionism stuff. So when it's not even really you know, what what you're looking at is not quite clear, right? It's it's yep. it's usually large groupings of color and different movement and stuff like that. I, to me, he I he liked he really liked loud hot colors. That was the first thing that yelled at me, right? Yeah. So if you look at if if you take like just Google saw lighter paintings and the first thing that <laughs> that's comes what I up, have up right now. That's what I have right now. For my because, for my reference, I'm like I just put saw lighter paintings <laughs> because I think that's that's a really good point. Is that um, and where that ag abstract expressionism came from was really if you look at his use of color, oh, yeah. I, it, it's just wild. It's all over the place. It's all over the place, but it's clear that there was a f that it was by design. You know, oh, yeah. it's not yeah. just chaos like Pollock is chaos, where he yeah. hopes that it'll find he'll find his piece. He clearly had a vision, and looking at how he likes to use, he loves hot colors: your reds, your oranges, your yellows, and and it really speaks to the viewer. I think, and that's where those hot colors become, as I put it, so loud. It's it just yeah. it just screams at you, right? Well, the, and, and yeah, and especially like when you look at, I'm, I'm looking at one of his um, his paintings, and I'm trying to pull up the name of it right now. And no, I don't care if you value my privacy website. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, no, it's just called Paint and Nude. But w the one thing I why I really like this 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 uh, painting is because it's almost like the it's a, so. Just to describe the painting, it is a female laying on her back with her legs up and her arms crossed behind her back. Uh, and she's laying on what looks to be like a mattress or something like that. Her skin tone is very monochromatic almost. Is this the one where she's like, is he actually is using some cold colors for once? I feel like when yes. he started to go into the nudes. Yeah. So we need to talk about that before. <laughs> let's let's back but, up a little bit. The Novo an over yeah. pullback for a little bit. So he went from abstract expressionism clearly, and he started to really fall in love with one particular subject. And that is the female form doing nudes. Oh, yeah. But it was, it, uh, like we talked about in our pre-show, it was very, very, uh, tasteful, very mm -hmm. artistic, nothing, um, untasteful about it for lack of a better word. And, and then you start to, you know, just like, artists go through a phase or you know their their yellow period or whatever period you want to call it he clearly went through doing abstract expressionism yeah. mashed up with with nudes yeah and, and and that's the thing it's the skin tones are very cool and monochromatic but then like if you look at the mattress that she's laying on or the um the piece of cloth that's covering her skin it's it's bright fluorescent green with okay, uh, I found dabs it. of and the orange. mattress is like a purple. It's a purple, yeah, yeah. And it's almost like they're 
it, it almost looks like he took black and white painting and just started painting on top of that with these loud colors and things like that. Classical, classically trained artists, you know, they're usually trained to make sure they're using color so that you're moving, so that the viewer's eyes are moving around the piece. And I feel that way with his use of his greens. So the cold mm -hmm. colors and this in this particular case are used almost to perfection because yeah. I I move I'm moving all over the piece. And because it's a female form, we're dealing with a lot of circles, a lot of a lot of those oval circles kind of shapes, anyways. And uh, it, it really adds to the overall flow of the piece. It's it, it his his work. It, you know, he could have stopped as a painter and have been incredibly successful, but he decided to keep going into different mediums, which is great, which I love. No, it's great, but it, it it's it's a great discussion to lead into his photography. When you start thinking and you start seeing his photography and what he did, it really starts making sense if you understand that he had this background and 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 in painting because Do you want to dive right into the photography i feel like we need to like spend a little more time on just his painting background or are you well okay because t buck I'm, I'm 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 jumping the gun because i'm excited to talk because well and it's the photography you want to get to right yeah. i mean that's that's what as far as he's one of your favorite photographers he's not necessarily mm -hmm. your favorite painter right no no uh, and in really to be honest when i first heard about him i i and this was maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, he didn't even know. He was and painter. when I really got deep into <laughs> photography, I had no idea he was a painter. I, I was looking for so let, let's let's take a T buck uh, tangent corner. Tangent corner here. Can I do a uh, tangent corner about the tangent corner? I was thinking about this yeah. the other day, and I was like, "What an oxymoron!" Because the corner is finite, <laughs> and we're stuck in it. And a that, and a tangent is supposed to be a rabbit hole, right? Exactly. So, it, it goes <laughs> off on one's place, but that that's that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, so there was okay, some thought. So you're saying, the, some oxy, thought. So you're saying the, oxymor the oxymoron use of you saying tangent corner is purposeful. So this yeah. is by design as well. It was by design. So I don't know if you guys know this, but T-Buck is clearly an artist himself. <laughs> when he uses, he's a, he's a, uh, he's a wordsmith. Well, he's and, a and a lot of people, tongue. so when they hear me <laughs> talk, because I am, I, I grew up in, in, the, in the middle of nowhere. It's become apparent, I think, in our other episodes that you you are a small town country boy. I'm a small town country boy, and I'm not as country dumb boy. as I sound. But I only know two languages. No one said that. Come on now. No, no, no. This is what I tell everybody. I know two languages. It's math and Kansas. What's the <laughs> what's the what's the tangent quarter? I feel like we went on a tangent corner. I don't even know. Okay, tangent, tangent corner. corner. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, photography photography go. um i, I, wait, I i'm always... not ready wait wait okay i'm ready you ready i'm buckled okay. i'm buckled you're buckled in i always wanted to be <laughs> like a photographer and you know when you turn you're a 30, good photographer yeah and I, I i dabbled in it but when i turned 30, you're best in the like, ndp family and our fan and our uh collective of artists you're the best well i, I mean a little love well, thank you. I, 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 I don't know if it's that. Anderson's right. pretty good with the uh, the food, the food photography. Oh, food he, art. Uh, no, we're probably going to have to do now an that episode guy, with him. That yeah. guy. So that's our producer. Troublemaker. Uh, Clayton Anderson. He is uh, he is a food photographer uh, and he does a really he does a really good job on it. He I don't want to uh, say his IG handle if he if he yeah uh, if he didn't clear it with me first, so we're he not going to say it. Um, but we may have a show he, with him doing a photog photography just on food. Anyway, sorry. We could ahead. we could have a whole tangent corner show on that guy. What? Okay. What? Oh no, I wanted to become a photographer. Okay, this go is ahead. okay. This is the point. And I I really you know this was like every girl I was dating at the time was like all over Instagram taking I so where I live right now I think the prerequisite for at least dating profile pictures is to have you know at the time it was like you had to uh, have at least some picture a selfie in a car okay <laughs> you had to have your friend take a picture of like you. on a dating app or what yeah or just yeah. an IG well both. You, okay. I would say it was both, but they would they would use them for both. But you had to have a picture in a car, uh, okay. maybe possibly duck face. They did, and <laughs> then to, and then you had to have a lot of like cool photography of being out in the wild in the mountains. And and I swear, in where I live right now, every 
every woman had a photo of them at Machu Picchu. I have no idea why. Machu Picchu? Really? Yeah. Yeah. No, seriously. My dad has been wanting to go to Machu Picchu ever since he started started a bucket list. That's all I oh, hear really? about from my dad. If we talk about vacations, we're talking about Machu Picchu. Well, I, I want to yeah, go to I think Machu everybody's Picchu. thinking vacations right now because they just want to get all out. <laughs> that's a good fuck. That's a great fucking point. God, yes. But 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 here here's the point here. What I'm trying to where I was trying to get at. I really wanted to get into a really good photographer as it was something I always wanted to do, and I I didn't want to fit the mold everything that I saw that people are taking on these dating apps and also on Instagram. And I really want to have some inspiration. So I started looking at um, doing a lot of film work, which is mainly what I do now and was just Googling one day, like famous color photographers. And I saw this one image and it blew me away. And it was, what's the image that that's going to be the segue. That's oh, yeah, gonna the be image... how we, how we, how we slide into the photography discussion. Like I could, so the image I could, a, it almost, when I saw it, I could smell the surroundings. Like I could smell the exhaust from the street cars, the uh, cigarettes smoke that was so, probably permeating out. I feel like I'm going to put you on the spot. Cause I love to see Buck squirm. I feel like we needed a little bit of an intro for just his photography. So now okay. why? And I will premise that with, urban or street style photography and explain to, to the good people what that is if they don't know what it is and why you could smell those things why you could feel those things in his pieces i think so basically street photography is kind of what it sounds like it's basically you're not doing landscape photography where you're out um, looking at broad landscapes it's mainly focused on everything happening around Vistas. you in an urban setting <laughs> for the most part you see a lot of this happen on, and there's a lot of street photographers and there's some great street photographers, but the reason I love this, his images and the first one I saw, and it's, it's uh, basically, I believe it's called taxi cab and it is a picture and you can't, you can tell. So this is why I love his, his photos. You can't really tell who is in the picture you, but you get a feeling and you can, you can see what he is actually taking a photo of. So you're getting a very kind of compressed image. And what you see is a taxi cab, a man sitting in the back of a taxi cab. All you see is his hand in the window, but the colors of it pop out. You see yellows, reds, and it's almost like the framing of it. It just, it gives you a whole different perspective. And it, it, it and why I was so uh, like attached to this is like, Oh my gosh, this is, this guy is creating, images and frames from his surroundings nobody or like i wouldn't even ever think of of taking photos of and it's it's incredibly beautiful and powerful it's it's so it's so it's so powerful and i think how you put it we need to do a definitely a discussion on his style of photography yeah in terms of framing so i'm getting ahead of myself my my bad. no 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 this is good no this is good i feel like we're, we're we're right on par um because just like we talked about in his painting style and stuff like that. So he was clearly classically trained on how to become a painter. And he used those uh, techniques, skills into his photography work. And Buck said it perfectly, how he frames a piece. That was the very first thing. So I had never heard. So let me, full disclosure, I had never actually heard of this photographer before uh, Buck said, I, we got to do an episode on this guy. He's, he's a, perfect example of a deep cut and we need to do a deep dive on him i said absolutely fine let's do it so i had to do my homework and that was wasn't that wasn't that the first thing i said to you i was like this guy this yeah. guy's framing is incredible because and i and then i said it like this he his photography like his pieces look like paintings yeah it's yeah. that good and and another thing I, I i had i heard and i can't remember the gentleman's name but um when I first was researching Saul Leiter, because I immediately became obsessed with his work, somebody said that a great photographer, um, you usually have to look at their photos twice to really understand it. Saul Leiter's, you have to usually look three or four times. Well, he liked to use, so another thing in his framing devices is he liked to take photos through things mm -hmm. or use... Um, reflections. Yeah, reflections. He would often take uh, pictures like through you know, 
a stained glass window or and that piece you were talking about so going back to that uh the taxi cab piece mm-hmm. he uses hot colors to again move your eye in a very circular way throughout the piece and he's clearly shot he shot it through something so the, yeah. the bottom half of the piece is this very blurred you know something in the foreground is focus, there it's not yeah. quite clear what it is right it's out of focus yeah. it's blurred and then, of course, because like every good painter, they're going to probably do somewhat of a good, you know, if if there is purpose and always a point of subject, right? There's always a point of focus where they want you to, they want your eye to always, like all the lines are going to gravitate towards mm-hmm. that usually, right? And for yeah. me, I don't know if it's the same. And, you know, art is subjective, of course. So so for me, it's the hand. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, everything points to that hand. Mm-hmm. And the hand's just holding on to the little what are those called? You know, it's just like a little leather strap just to hold on to. Yeah. Right? Like you had in a lot of old cars, like that would help you get out of the car or hold on to it. And I think this is to piggyback on your point. I, to me, his pieces are stories. I feel yeah. like that's like every, every artist at the end of the day is a storyteller. If they're not a literal storyteller, like an author or something, um, you know, whatever medium they use there, it's always going to be about, in my opinion, my humble opinion, it's always going to be about the human condition and it's going to tell a story about that condition. There's another thing about his, and I'm, I'm just scrolling through and like looking at these right now. There is a simplic- simplicity. It's a, like, I think when we're, when we're talking about it, it's, they almost seem like his photos are complex to a point. To be honest, they're, well, they're actually both. they're complex. They're complex, they're but simple. they're very minimalistic. Almost yeah. the, like that Japanese kind of minimalism that you you've seen in a lot of art. There's almost like that feel to it. Where I mean, these are just very simple images. I mean, like the other ones that some of my favorites are the ones that he took through a door or window that was basically fogged up and had um um, a lot of condensation on the windows just because it was a cold day outside and the heat from the in, indoors was causing that con- condensation and just taking photos of uh, people standing outside of that uh, um, condensation filled window. You really, you can't really make out, a, you can make out figures, but you can't like really, you can tell that there's a person there you can tell that there's a truck in the background, but it's almost kind of blurry just from that con- condensation. But it's also, it, again, it's very powerful and um, moving that you you can tell what these images and these shapes are. It like making it look like a painting, like you said. It it, it looks like a painting that somebody would just sit down and right. draw. But he, it's a photograph. He does an incredible job of using um, space, mm-hmm. scale, and uh, we we already talked about movement with this color schemes. Usually, he'll stick to the hots, or you know now you know after. Clearly, when he got into the nudes, he got into more cold colors. Um, the nudes. <laughs> the nudes. And um, and he did, you know, just to, just to segue into the evolution of him falling in love with uh, those particular subjects. Because his main subjects were always people. I mean, yeah. let's, let's just focus on that. It doesn't have to be the female form of nudes uh, specifically. It's always been people. And that's where the urban you know, quote unquote, urban photography comes from street photographies because he's taking a lot of pictures of just people on the streets that doesn't even know he's taking pictures of them. And but there's there's a story there again. Yeah. You know, there's a story there. But but then there would be clearly models. He would hire models or however he got them to do real photography nudes. And again, they're very tasteful. They're not. Yeah. They're very artistic. They're, th- those were usually, from the ones I've seen, there is usually black and whites. So he would have to use a lot of different lighting f- uh, framing devices, right? So going to that into that direction, even though he, you know, we're talking a lot about his color work, he he did a, a lot, t- lot, lot of black, black and, and white, white work, my, my especially God. with this. And like what you're talking about, you can find this in a collection uh, called In My Room. Um, and I actually own this um, this uh photo book but you're right he he does a lot of things like it's very tasteful it's very artistic the one thing i really love that he does a lot is he does a lot of reflections so he'll take a photo of somebody in a mirror uh woman you know in a pose or uh the other thing goes back to his framing where um i've tried it's it's influenced me a lot but um trying to put different perspectives on things by 
framing things in your environment. So he's done, there's another famous photo out of that, that uh, album. It's a partially closed door and he's maybe like six or seven feet away from that door, but the subject is in another room behind this door. And so you can see part of the subject, but they're framed within the door. So it's actually a frame within a frame of the photo. Hmm. So again, I mean, he's using his environment and his surroundings to really give these unique perspectives. So again, your eyes are drawn towards the center and the subject in the room, but there's a lot going on around it. So it's almost like, you know, like I said, taking a, 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 a photo within a photo. And I, I've noticed that even if things may have been staged, you know, we weren't there clearly, even if things may have been staged, there's such a authenticity to his work. Yeah. Like it doesn't everything, feel like it is. Right. Everything feels like it was just caught in the moment, that nothing yep. was staged. Even when he does the framing devices, right? So even when he's using space and scale and a lot of things in the foreground versus background to really give some weight to the to the photo, it doesn't look like anything was moved deliberately in a place to create that image, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It just all seems very organic. Yeah, that's a perfect way to put it, organic. And his black and whites, I mean, the black and whites is when I really focus on them before, besides the things we've already talked about, is he has to really, and he may be doing this with exposure or saturation. I, this is probably where you need to speak a little more to that because that's definitely not my wheelhouse. But yeah, the whites seem particularly white. You know, like there's definitely some, a little bit of experimentation going on. Yeah, so let's get into this because this is really... I feel like a lot of people are still emulating his look and style and of his photos. Uh, but today we have things like Lightroom, Photoshop. Um, oh my God. Yes. We have the a, digital a million tricks. Yeah. We have digital dark rooms that we can do all these different and he, tricks. He had none of this. <laughs> he had yeah. none of this. And, and, and this is why I'm so kind of drawn to film because, um, and you can call me a hipster or what, whatnot. Photography um, film or like, Photography Movie film, film. Yeah. cinema, photography film. Okay. film. Yeah. Okay. So the reason I'm so Didn't drawn want to, to confuse this, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. It's a. It's a. There's almost kind of like a, to, to be really corny. So real like, film, right? Not digital. Yeah, like real film, like uh, 35 millimeter film. There you um, go. Okay. So we're all on the same page. <laughs> we're we're all we're all headed in the right we're, direction. We're all in the same train. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Go. We're all going down to T bucks. No, uh, it's not a quarter. No, we're already on the track. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but but so this is really cool because I, I I really got into this a few years ago and I've experimented with it and had had some really kind of cool results. But he would work a lot with um, so there, there's this method of tampering with your film a little bit where you could actually heat do you could heat the film that you're using and basically you know kind of doing these different um, methods would kind of change the way the film was processed and exposed in the end so you might get brighter more saturated reds um some films already have uh, i think he, i believe he used kodachrome which is no longer made but it was a really popular film uh, to use back then but it was always known kind of for the reds in that film the pop a lot and this would kind of enhance that saturation or he would do kind of the opposite because film was so expensive uh film actually has an expiration date and once it goes past the expiration date, because there are chemicals involved, um, you get kind of unexpected and not maybe the greatest results. So sometimes you get muted colors or you might get one color that really pops out more than anything. So you can see in some of his um, his work where you have these really muted colors that, or there might be a case like I would say with the red umbrella uh, photos where it almost looks like the surroundings are monochromatic black and white but you have this really beautiful bright red umbrella in the middle of the scene. And people do this today, you know, in their digital uh, dark rooms that try to make this uh, effect happen. This guy was doing it, you know, in a, in a dark room, um, you, you just using expired or modified film uh, to get that result and didn't had no idea how this was going to turn out. Um, obviously there's some dark room manipulation that you can do, um, but it, it's really, really cool. It's impressive. And it, it, it creates, uh, let's talk about tone, you know, of the story. It creates a lot of emotion because um, when he's making the blacks really black or the whites really white, or obviously the reds popping in the umbrella 
example. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I feel like the just going back to the black and whites for a little bit, there's a sadness to them, right? There's like this, there's a melancholy. If essence. you look at, I think a great example is his, um, the photo called Hats. Maybe send it to you, but um, I, I, I agree that. with you. It, it's basically, there is, I, I almost, I don't know if I would say sadness, but almost a mystery. Well, sure. I mean, it could be, again, it's subjective. It can be yeah. anything to the viewer, whatever. Just, you know, you're either going to put yourself into the world or be an objective bystander, right? Yeah. And, and, and basically the, the photo that I'm thinking of right now is it's, it's on the subway. Um, and he's, he's taking like a photo of, out. Yeah, like, he's you know, taking like a person a f- looking out of the subway. Well, uh, looking, he, he's on the subway car itself, but he's he's photographing two gentlemen who were sitting uh, across the aisle from him. They're both wearing hats, but you can't make out any facial features or anything. You just see their silhouettes against okay, the the it. window. Yeah. And um, <laughs> again, that's a really powerful image because, again, you, you, it takes you a minute to kind of think about well what am i really looking at here and then you kind of see it and then you know when you're starting to think of how you would process something like this obviously it looks almost underexposed in some areas but in a lot of areas it looks maybe a little overexposed um you can but really maybe tell to a purposeful effect exactly it there's it's there's a purpose behind it to make it look that way um and i and i think that's that's the the brilliance of this and this guy obviously has an eye and what I've read from stories about him is he just, when he would do this, he just always carried a camera with him. And so this wasn't like he spent like three weeks just like taking every picture that he could. He just, he waited and was patient for the opportunity to rise. And when he saw it, he would take these photos. Snap. Snap, snap, snap. Bam. Bam. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's the brilliance of this. Um, and, you know, the whole point of why I, I'm so fascinated and why I love this guy you know, you find, I think the greatest artists out there and especially photographers find beauty in the ordinary. And you can, you can really, I mean, there's another photo that he has of a, of a green umbrella, somebody holding a green umbrella under a don't walk sign. And you're like, okay, that, you know, it's just very, um, you wouldn't really think of anything if you're just walking through the street and you see that image. I mean, it's something you see every day. When, <laughs> when, when you said, you know, beauty in the ordinary, I, all I could think of was the movie American Beauty, where he's like videotaping that plastic bag oh. in the wind. <laughs> and you know what's you see you know the most what's beautiful kind of, thing I've ever seen? <laughs> you know what's kind of as much as there's a pretentiousness to that when we talk about it. I remember how the director filmed that scene, and I actually felt that way. I was like, there is beauty in ordinary, mundane. Things that you would never associate traditional beauty with. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Like, um, and I've always been kind of drawn to that, especially like living in an environment that a lot of people think is not that pretty. That's pretty boring. But I always say like anywhere you go, there's a beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Like yeah, it's show. in the eye of the beholder and in, in what you can really <laughs> find. If if you automatically predetermine that they this said is ugly. The, they said the title of the show. I feel like they <laughs> it's you know, full the circle. Like, the movie like it's in movies become or TV when they actually say it, like say the title of the show or the movie, you have <laughs> or to the say movie. that to yourself. Yeah. Oh my god. I hate when that happens. <laughs> that like, makes oh me my... cringe so much. They said the title. They said he the just title. said the title. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I don't know. Now I'm now I'm upset about when they say that in, in TVs. And no, no, movies. we did we did it. Yeah, beauty's in the I'm eye of the beholder. I'm trying to think of a good example of who just, just like art is in the eye of the beholder. Hence the show. Yeah, and face off. That's the <laughs> one that got me the most. I'm sorry, but remember Wait, when, face when, off. When, yeah, when, you know the face off with uh, corner with Nicolas Cage and Nicolas fucking... Cage and John Travolta and Nick Cage is having. What is like the con- his... Okay, now I have to hear the connection. Well, no, what, so you remember he's having like that crazy moment. Like it's after they switch faces. <laughs> And he's like talking about like what he wants to do. He wants to cut the guy's face off, <laughs> his face off. And it's it 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 make it's still to this day because I watch it every once in a while. It makes me just start cracking. I actually, you know, I um, it's a John Woo joint. It's a John Woo joint. Oh yeah, I like John Woo. Um, so 
I have been up obs- just to go on a little bit of a no- Novo tangent corner here. I've always been obsessed with having the most powerful title with the least amount of content or words. I think mm. Gone Girl is a perfect example of that because um, she's literally gone, you know, like she goes missing. But then when you see her later in the movie, she you realize she's gone kind of mad. So her, she's a literal Gone Girl and she's a figurative Gone Girl. So I think that's like a perfect title. And I actually feel that way about Face Off. That's that's my point. That's what I was getting at. Oh, OK. Because of the because of the slash, because the, it's, it, it's literally a face off. But then they're facing off against each other. The movie is you. silly. Let's, the movie let's, is silly let's, and it's let's, ridiculous. Let's not, it's, yeah, it's let's, like a great '90s. Uh, let's call a spade a movie. spade. The movie is ridiculous. Oh, oh yeah, it's it's definitely yeah. a product of its time. Kind of like a lot of a lot of uh, of his movies, like Con Air and shit. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it is a good title. Is my point. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to say Con Air is a great title for <laughs> Con Air. Uh, I think oh, we should pull man. it back. Let's pull. Let's do yeah. a novel pull back. Um, so the photography work, uh, we are getting probably close to the third act of our show here. Yeah, I think we can still talk about. Gosh, I feel like it's hard to talk I think about. We've it. covered. We've covered a little. Ev- so we wanted to cover cover color. We colored. Mm-hmm. We covered that. We wanted to cover framing, yeah. uh, movement size shape scale i feel like we're missing sub something we did subjects he does a lot of people a lot of uh street uh, humanity pieces is also what they're called we mm-hmm. should maybe talk about there's there's such a uh, a globalism a existentialism if you will to his pieces that's probably a good yeah. place to start wrapping up the the world that is Saul lighter so why don't you start with that and what you mean by the existentialism of of his pieces? Oh man, I'm on the that. spot now. Did the now, tables I'm gonna put turn? You on the spot. Well, remember the tables turn. The tables have turned because you gave me full reign of this episode. So that is true. That is you, true. This I is why take... you probably don't. So want to put... yeah, I want you to lead me. I don't know. I like being here. on the spot a little bit. I like this. No. Is, this is my my favorite part about the show is our improv. So this is kind of like improv to me. Anyway, so the humanity of his pieces are. Well, it's clear in his subjects. So obviously we're dealing with people. <laughs> we are humans. So of course there's a humanity to it. But like I said previously, just to bring such this a close up loops on some of our subject matter within the thesis, is that there's stories to be told in his pieces. Mm-hmm. And um, as humans, we all live a story uh, with our lives, but he's taking small uh, chunks of that with his his photographs. And he's bringing it to a wider audience to understand themselves a little better in the pieces themselves. That that's great. I think I think you summed it up perfectly. And I think yeah, I I, I think you know talking about there's a story in his his fo- his photographs. I think again that that kind of goes back to what makes a great artist is you know we always. You, you, <laughs> I'm thinking of that image of the person standing right in front of a art piece and just staring at it and like being like, Can you like see Ferris Bueller's symbolism? Day Off kind of shit. Yes. Where they when they go to, to the museum and they and there's a montage of them just being at the museum looking <laughs> yeah. at shit. Yeah, <laughs> but it, there there is a truth to that. Even when there is a truth to that. I mean, this this is where uh, it's so it's 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 a weird thing to talk about because it's it could be simultaneously pretentious, but there yeah. is but there is an art to looking at art. I hate to put it that way. You know, like there is such an art to constructive uh, criticism, very traditional artistic critique. And uh, with his pieces, I I guarantee you will find yourself somewhere in them. Yeah. And the one thing when I tell everybody, you know, when I've, when I've introduced this to other people and they've been like, Oh, this is great. What does it mean? Or, what's the story behind these things? I think you always have to like, you have to take your own interpretation and especially when I think this is just an art in general. Um, Cause I think why people get turned off a lot is because of those kind of pretentious people that are really like, no, this is, this is the symbolism. This is what the art oh, yeah, is. This is what it has to be. And I feel it like it has to be this. Yeah. I, I, I'm on your, I'm on your side. I'm on, I'm on team subjectivity where yeah i think there probably is a level of purpose 
but beyond yeah. that you get to create the, the ending in your head you know yeah. what's what's the ending to the story it's a make your own story and that's the whole purpose of it is it's not you know it's a, it's a it's a person expressing themselves and then giving you their expression to for your interpretation do you want to I, I it's kind of your episode buck I, is I, there more to be said or are, are, are we going to say thank you and then you're going to you're going to pause and say but before we go i think i think we're i think we've gotten through a lot i mean you know we can talk about some of his publications and maybe some recommendations i have already said in my room yeah um, always the young stranger i think it's still an exhibit Right? Yeah. Isn't yeah, there is. like they re they redid it at MoMA or something like that? Yeah. Or they just kind of kept it I th- there's a consistent I think he's got a consistent showing showing in a lot area. Of, yeah. In several institutions across the country in, in the world too. He's got he's got some exhibitions. Um Ooh, I actually I have something to wrap it up. And I'm gonna put you I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna flip the tables again oh, on you. And 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 I wanna hear I'll make it easy on you. I want to okay. hear one, no, two examples of of maybe a photographer or or someone in a different medium that he clearly has inspired. How his I mean, legacy has one. his legacy clearly transcends his death. He passed away in 2013, and you are you should just say yourself <laughs> that that would have that's that would be the easiest one. It's like, yeah, well, I, mean, I, I am I am the inf- I'm I've been influenced. Yeah, I, I think if you've if you've looked at some of my photographs, um, especially my street kind of photography that I've done, definitely he's been a big influence on that. Trying to find kind of different framing, and um, I did this a lot when I when I did uh, a lot of ghost towns. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of fascinated with when I'm going back home and driving and stopping in these little places that you know were booming back in like the 30s and 40s but now are are just shells of them for ourselves so i'm just trying to really it's what it's taught me you know i'm not trying to exactly copy him but it's really well yeah you have to be inspired and then and then incorporate the style into your own style i I think the biggest thing it's just made me stop and think on how i can frame something with with just ordinary objects or or things like that get away from figuration more of the abstract but really trying to um, compose an image before you really take it. I think too many people today and that's, you know, but that's a beauty of digital photography is you can, yeah, you take hundreds of pictures. um, You can manipulate. You can manipulate and you can turn it to whatever your heart desires. But really with film or, or in, in what I've, when I've switched back to digital photography, it's really made me stop and think what I'm doing first. Um, so that was a little bit of a tangent, but I would say that's a big influence. I would say he's, he's got a huge influence on a lot of people and I, I, I and it's pretty, is there anyone really well known that sticks out to you? That'd be like, I, I, I can't think of off the top of my head, but the example I was going to do is look at Instagram and a lot of, um, <laughs> look at everybody, everybody's in, been influenced. Well, but yeah, but I mean, if you look at a lot of the techniques he used, like Instagram filters, some of them are based off of looking at old photogra- f- photographs that have had that kind of expired that film. That grainy, look. yeah. That grainy or that muted color or the colors are a little, they're not really representative of, you know, actual, you know, there's either saturation or desaturation or um, some sort of mute, muted color scheme going on there. I mean, a lot of that is based off of, you know, some of this stuff that guys like Saul Leiter um, or some of the other um, New York style, you know, school of photographers kind of invented on their own kind of this, um, this look and feel. So I, I, you know, unfortunately I I can't think of one off the top of my head and I'm probably going to kick. No, you already did. I I think that is the closer. We all have been inspired by him. We all have. And and you just didn't know it. So if you haven't heard of this, particular photographer all you listeners out there you need to check out his shit right check it out now let us know what you like about it leave yeah, comments tweet at below. us are we yeah i am smash that like here. button <laughs> and subscribe <laughs> subscribe give us and all then, your money on patreon and then tell and then tell the good people thank you thank you yes, for listening thank you. and make a cameo if you want a cameo <laughs> novo will record a cameo of whatever you like he will say anything. that's right that's right. Exactly. So thank you for listening, all you beautiful people out there. But before we go, T-Buck, what do we got for him? 
There's a parting gift. There's a parting gift. I think that's what we call a gem of the week. Oh, it's the gem of the week. That is correct. And tell the good people what the gem of the week is. All right. Well, you know, when I was thinking of photography and going through this, I wanted to pick out somebody that's not really that well known, but I really enjoy. And somebody that I do follow on Instagram, uh, his name is uh, Joseph Tiglazan. I'm going to murder that. (laughs) Sorry, I believe he's a Hungarian uh, gentleman that lives in Stockholm or in Sweden okay. somewhere. Um, but his uh, his uh, handle on uh, Instagram. Oh man, I'm dating myself by calling a handle. Uh, his username is called uh, Tiglazan. Nerd alert over here. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. What's your handle on? Oh, IRC that was good. Chat? That was good. Oh, uh, uh, what's your? Uh, I just IRC got back from the and, uh, Star uh, Wars convention. <laughs> Yeah, hey, like my, it's my favorite nerd voice. You're welcome. Remember, we did that <laughs> at uh, the premiere of uh, uh, what was it? The Big Blue Cats from Outer Space. Um, oh, Avatar. Avatar. We we spent maybe a solid half hour in talking in that and voice character. online and annoying everybody <laughs> around us because we had these ridiculous 3D glasses on. Just, these weren't uh, like the shades; they looked like snorkel goggles. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Oh, you're good. Okay, but uh, yeah, uh, Tiglazan, uh, T I G L E Z A N, or Z A N for our uh, listeners across the pond. So check it out. And uh, my gym of the week, mine is a photographer named Storm Thurgeson or Thorgeson. I've talked mm, about him yeah. in other shows. He is the famous photographer behind the artwork for all of Pink Floyd's uh, album covers. Uh, if you haven't seen our episode on surrealism on our art history episode, I'm absolutely obsessed with surrealism, the movement that is surrealism. To this day, I've always been drawn to surreal works, and his work is a version of that in the photography in the yeah photography medium. And sometimes I, I've read that sometimes it's staged, like he's actually taking a picture of of real real things going on, and then sometimes mm. it's manipulated to create ah. a surreal look. Um, I, you know, a good example is, uh, wish you were here with the man on fire, shaking hands with someone. I'm pretty sure he was really on fire that, that, that it was probably a stunt man or something to get those shots, uh, stuff like that. He's also done work for Muse, um, the Mars Volta. I'm big fans of those, uh, bands as well. And his work is spellbinding in, uh, surreal photography, which, uh, Muse cover, yeah. Um Probably the one that's so like a bunch of flying people it looks like. And there's oh, like okay. a shadow of it looks like people flying or something like that. You, I'm in the dark now so you can't see the face I'm making but yeah. <laughs> I couldn't see you all show, man. Well, we're supposed my, to react to each other my webcam time, and he's just like he's in he's been in darkness the whole show working. and I I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm like too bright. Does does, does my does my feed look too bright to you? No, it looks great. Oh, no, thanks. but I mean, I, I I just realized I've been sitting in the dark for like oh, the thanks. past hour. Yeah, you've been sitting in the dark. A, a creep and I was and like, talking about nude art photography. So if my neighbors you, can you hear know me, what he's I'm into. Sorry. You know what he's into. Yeah. In the dark photography discussions about In nudes. the dark. It's the greatest thing ever. It's the best. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> Let's. I'll stop. Let's. Let's not go too far into. I know. I knew where you were going with that. Um. Thank you guys so much for listening. These are so much fun to do. We love sharing this stuff with you. Uh, if you like that, you can follow us, of course, at all of our socials. That's at underscore Novo underscore Day, and Day is just D E, not D A Y. And at Novo Day Media, you can of course follow all of our updates on our socials, but also our website Novo excuse me, novadayproductions.com. And there you can find some of our work as well, such as uh, novels, The Entropy Sessions, Adulteration and Post Meridium, audiobook version of The Entropy Sessions. So fucking check that out. We're very proud of that. And until next time, be good to each other for the love of Christ. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions. Created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media, at Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company. Facebook.com slash Music 123 Aco on Spotify.
Logo designed by Tom Justus, J-E-S-T-U-S, of thejusticecompany.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved.